Hello and welcome. My name is Yufir Singh, and I'm the CEO of Suez Water Technologies and Solutions. As a global business unit of Suez, Water Technologies and Solutions is a trusted partner providing industry-leading water technology and process expertise worldwide. We deliver advanced products, processes, and solutions that give our customers a competitive edge. All of this is backed by a foundation of digital excellence that will drive results at our customers for decades to come. In today's session, you'll hear from some of our digital experts as we spotlight IoT solutions for the industry. We have a terrific lineup prepared, including our guest speaker, Paul O'Callaghan from Bluetech, as well as a panel discussion, which highlights some of our most innovative IoT developments and technologies. So why the focus on digital and IoT? The world as we know it is changing. Much of it is driven by digital. From the cars that we drive, to the phones and devices that we use, to the media and entertainment we consume. And now finally, to the tools and technologies we're using in the water industry. The water industry has traditionally taken a pretty conservative approach when it comes to adopting new technologies. But we don't believe this is any longer the case. Digital is now front and center, and more so because of COVID-19. Many more organizations are relying on a remote workforce to maintain business continuity. So there's definitely a greater demand for digital tools and remote monitoring, as well as remote control. Whether it's a power plant, a water utility, a food and beverage manufacturer, or basically any other industry, these organizations and facilities are in need of digital solutions to maintain pro productivity, but at the same time meeting social distancing guidelines. While we're now seeing a greater demand for these solutions, digital is nothing really new for our business. We've been developing our own digital solutions for over 30 years now, starting with our pace setter series of controllers, our inside asset management performance platform, and now with the creation of advanced IoT technologies like edge devices and analytics. From Suez's perspective, IoT is at the very heart and soul of the services we provide to our customers. This is an area we deeply believe in and we've substantially invested in to grow our capabilities to offer one of the most comprehensive end-to-end -end IoT solutions in the water industry. Today's session will touch on many more of these developments, as well as some of the newer IoT trends and technologies that are impacting both Suez and the water industry as a whole. Now I'm going to turn it over to Ralph Exton, our Chief Marketing and Chief Digital Officer, to get us started. I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Yubir, and hello, everyone. As Yubir said, I'm Ralph Exton, Chief Marketing and Chief Digital Officer here at Suez Water Technologies and Solutions. Uh, and look, as someone who has worked in the water industry for over 33 years, I've seen a lot of new technologies come into play during this time, but nothing has excited me as much as the emergence of IoT, the Internet of Things. And IoT, it's not just a buzzword, it's really where the integration of IT, information technology, and OT, operational technology, come together. And this enables organizations to create a digital network of physical devices and allows for greater visibility into operations, whether at a plant or individual asset level, like a cooling tower or a boiler or a membrane bioreactor. It also simplifies and standardizes data collection and can enable things like remote control and remote-based services. Uh, today, we're joined by one of the leading experts in the water industry, Paul O'Callaghan, CEO of Bluetech, also a friend of mine, and he'll talk more about the major trends in the IoT space and up and coming digital innovations. Paul will also share his experiences in making the amazing new documentary, Brave Blue World, which is now available on Netflix. 
So now, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul. Paul, please take it away. Thank you very much, Ralph. And it's a privilege and honor to present at Suez Open Innovation Day. So thank you very much for having me. My keynote today relates to industrial internet of things, which is often hard to describe, but perhaps let's begin by saying what it's not. The industrial internet of things is not using Zoom for teleconferencing, although that is fantastic and we all are very grateful that we have such tools available to us. That is not a digital revolution. If you talk to wastewater treatment plant or drinking water treatment plant or industrial plant operators about what it means to them, you get a much more nuanced answer where they really are seeing the value in being able to operate their plants remotely, benefit from machine learning and automation. Now, the pandemic has increased our use of tools like video conferencing. It will also increase the rate of adoption of digital for one very simple reason. In the municipal sector, there's less revenue available. And that fundamentally means that people have to be able to do more with less to provide the same water and wastewater services while operating on reduced budgets because revenue take is down due to lower consumption rates in our cities or offices or towns. And while domestic consumption may be up, that's not always reflected in increased revenue to the water utility. And of course, it's very difficult to deal with delinquent payments when sections of the population have been furloughed or made unemployed. That creates an environment where there's a very strong motivator to want to be very efficient in the use of chemicals, in the use of energy, and also in our ability to control, operate plants remotely and conduct preventative maintenance to reduce maintenance costs. One other thing that has continued unabated this year is investment into water innovation. And one of those areas is smart water. And in fact, if you look at this data that we've just recently produced at Bluetech, what's really notable is if you look at the top three areas of investment, smart water, decentralized treatment, and emerging contaminants, those three represent 50% of all of the investments, either by number or by value, in the water sector. And if we add in the circular economy and resource recovery, that increases to 70% of the value. What's interesting as well is if you look at where the investments are being made, they're being made oftentimes into technologies and companies that occupy different places in the value chain, or they're creating new value chains. So notably, some of these rounds are large, 50 million going into source water for water from air, 45 million into new light for bioplastics production, 40 million into alonia for PFAS destruction. Also notable, look at the investors that are making these investments. These are not some of the traditional groups you would see investing in water. They're investing into non-traditional opportunities, oftentimes point of use, decentralized treatment, smart water, if you look at water from air, bioplastics, satellite data, um, filtration in the home, man and home, other place to bed into a company called Second Nature, uh, sewer-based epidemiology with the company Biobot Analytics. And all these trends come together. We talk about the trend in digital, which can enable decentralized treatment. And of course, sensors and information technology tell us more about what's in our water, the quality of our water, which drives increasing demands for purity on behalf of the consumer. Now, as we look at the editorial calendar that Blue Tech has prepared for next year, we're mapping across those areas to ensure that we get coverage on key market trends, key technology areas, upcoming crises. And indeed, this year, we focused in on a number of these areas like AI and decision support tools. And examples, for example, like the Suez empower solution that allows us to optimize condenser performance within power plants to reduce energy, uh, reduce maintenance costs. These are the types of solutions that have a very strong value proposition. Water is made up of many different technologies in many different areas, but there are seven key themes that we've identified as we look forward to 2025 or 2030 that we believe are part of this future. The first is earth observation science. 
we believe this will change our understanding of water risk, our understanding of the risk of too much water and also too little water. And we believe it's going to be very powerful in giving utilities and industries more information on how water affects their operations. The second is the miniaturization of water technologies. Things are getting smaller. I guess in the same way that mainframe computing allowed us to get a personal computer and ultimately a personal computer became a mobile phone or a cell phone. This trend is evident in water if you look at sanitation with the Bill Gates reinvented toilet type devices. It's also evident in point of use systems at the home level like Hydroloop or indeed some Japanese technologies that are being brought to market that cover this area as well. Indeed, showers that recycle water over and over again. Ralph, you've spoken about edge computing um, at the recent conference in Israel on digital water. We're seeing this concept of edge water treatment and a pull from industry that's quite interested in the possibility of being able to treat and reuse at different points around the factory floor. First became evident in ultra pure water because these campuses are so large that you can introduce contamination even in the pipelines moving the water about. Um, radical decentralization is another key theme in the emerging world. Democratization is a macro level trend in that people are becoming more engaged. Power is being put into the hands of the consumer. And that applies to water where people have access to data to understand what's in their water. They also can potentially now access really high tech water solutions. Sure, point of use filters, but potentially recycling rainwater or water from showers. Digitization allows us to manage supply and demand more efficiently. And oftentimes in water crisis, we have a management problem rather than a fundamental underlying problem. And again, to borrow Ralph on some of the terms that you would speak about, there's the information technology married with the operational technology. And when you put the two together, you can understand risk much better and balance those two aspects of supply and demand. All of this allows us to embrace new business models. Unlock market opportunity, particularly I think for the 2.5 billion people that don't have access to sanitation today and the billions that don't have access to safe drinking water. And there's a final piece in this, which is interesting. It's blue green infrastructure, which in one sense is different to digital in that it's very much related to the use of natural treatment systems, plant-based systems, but we can also use these two things together in synergy and combination. And we believe these are some of the key themes that we will see in the years ahead. Now, with all of this talk about software and hardware, I wanted to speak a little bit about the Brave Blue World Project, which Suez was a tremendous partner on. If we think about human beings, we are essentially, you know, this is Stone Age hardware. The last hardware upgrade that we had as a species was 300,000 years ago. But we're running 21st century software on this Stone Age hardware. One thing we do know about this hardware is we are hardwired to absorb information through stories. And that hasn't changed. We love to learn about what's that person doing or what happened over there, or that's human nature. So when we embarked on our communications project, the Bravely World film documentary, we took that on board. It's written extensively by Yuval Noah Harari in the book Sapiens that it's a unique aspect of humanity that allows us to come together as a society and cooperate in incredible ways because we can share a common goal. And one of the other things we're hardwired to do is we get happiness when we work together towards a common shared goal. And that's another positive aspect of humanity to be embraced. Now, we worked on a film documentary last year which seems like a whole other world ago. We were in a different continent every second week. We traveled to India, to Africa, Mexico, across North America, around Europe, and everywhere we went, we were capturing stories. And in preparing for this talk, 
I was asked, what did I learn on the journey? I think I learned, A, the impact that the work that we do has on people's lives in a very meaningful way. It's very easy to understand it in an abstract way. It's challenging to understand it in a real way, and you have to almost see it to really understand and get it. And that, for me, was a revelation and an eye-opener. Secondly, I learned the power of stories, because it's when you can show the impact in a person's life that people really absorb that. And while we're fascinated with the technologies which can achieve tremendous things, connecting that to the impact that it has on people's lives is very, very important to accelerating the adoption of these solutions. And whether that was in India, where we saw in Chennai, people were capturing rainwater, blending it with recycled gray water, using black water, treated black water for irrigation, all these things were coming together in apartment blocks in a city of 10 million people. In Mexico, factories going to close water loops, Chicago resource recovery, um, biomimetic membranes being employed in Denmark for water purification. But everywhere you went, the spirit was the same. It was this idea of pioneering and breaking new ground. And we're delighted to share with you that the film went live on Netflix on October the 21st, a date I will never forget. And we're forever grateful to the participation of all of the partners, Suez, WTS, Vinod, who features in the film, and to see it side by side, to see water side by side with the David Attenborough documentary, with My Octopus Teacher. I think it's a very positive thing for our industry as a whole in allowing us to bridge outside to a, a wider audience whom we, we serve every day, but perhaps they don't always, are not always aware that we're doing that. So with that, I, I wish you well with the rest of your event and thank you very much, Ralph. Hey, thanks, Paul. That was really fantastic. And you know, it certainly is true that people throughout the water industry are trying to do more with less. And while unfortunately this is nothing new, I'm happy to say that digital and IoT solutions are giving operators the tools they need to make this happen. Like you, I'm excited by the opportunities that data brings to the industry in the form of new business models and greater access to water and a positive impact on the environment. Let's shift gears a bit though. Um, now you'll get to hear from some of my colleagues uh, from both the US and Europe for a discussion on some of the Suez innovations in IoT and in analytics. Hello everyone, uh, and welcome to today's panel discussion. As you've heard throughout the session already, IoT tools and technologies like sensors and controllers, edge devices, asset performance management software, advanced analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. You know, there's so many things here, and, and quite frankly, they're all here to stay. And at Suez, we're using these technologies in new ways to help meet the changing customer needs and deliver better outcomes for them. I'm joined today by, by several of our experts who will talk more about Suez's IoT solutions for industry. Let me start with uh, Joelle. Joelle Vanderboer, is our senior vertical leader for power, metals and mining for Europe and CIS, and he's based in, in Belgium. Joel brings a vast knowledge and experience working with our Empower Analytic. Uh, this uses real-time sensor data from heat exchange assets to help operators identify fouling in steam surface condensers. I also have uh, with me today, Dan Walter who's our industry business development leader based in the United States. Uh, as an expert in biofuels and the ethanol industry, Dan has been leading the way in the development of IVAP, which is another advanced analytic. This one is designed to optimize the performance of, of ethanol evaporators. And finally, I have Andrew Leach with us. And Andrew is our global product and technology manager for monitoring solutions, also based here in the US. And Andrew oversees a portfolio of, of hardware solutions that enable remote monitoring and diagnostics and is one of our leading experts on this very timely topic. So now that you know a little bit about our esteemed panelists, let's go ahead and jump right in and get started. So I'm gonna start off with Joel. Joel and I have worked together for a long time um, and he always has uh, great ideas on whatever topics that we're tackling. But Joe, I want to start with you because I want to talk a little bit about that 
that whole aspect of why it's so important to monitor asset performance. Um, you know, we've heard a little bit about it uh, earlier, and, and I mentioned Empower, but, you know, love to hear it in your own words. Well, Ralph, that's a very good and a valid question, and uh, it's rather easy to answer because uh, the assets which our customers own, of, co of course, are very important for them because they allow them to make money and hopefully also some profit. So it's really important that um, these assets that they run continuously without stopping, they only can stop when they have a shutdown. Yeah? But that's not sufficient. They should also run as efficient as possible, near design efficiency, as we call it. And that's why we should monitor these assets. One of the major assets our industrial customers have are their critical heat exchangers. Yeah. Um, we should keep them as clean as possible to get the maximum output out of, out of them. Because there, that allows the customer to make the most money out of these uh, tools which he has in place. Yeah. So that's uh, the importance of uh, monitoring these uh, these assets, these uh, critical heat exchangers, uh, Ralph. And we have, as you know, as you have seen in the in the video, which we showed before, we have uh, Insight, which are which are, is our highly protected, highly safe uh, cloud-based uh, asset performance management platform. And what we recently developed is an add-on. We have now also Empower. Yeah? which is a tool which allows us to calculate the efficiency and to monitor this efficiency of these critical heat exchangers of these important assets of our customer. That's great. I, look, Empower is very exciting. And if I were a customer though, but what are the key benefits to me as a customer uh, of using this, this powerful analytic tool, Empower? Well, Empower is a calculation model. Yeah, so Empower is really designed for power customers who produce electricity out of fossil fuel, gas, coal, nuclear, whatever. Biomass, renewables now also very important. And of course, to make the most profit, um, they need to have a tool, which is the condenser, which is their critical heat exchanger, the heart of their plant to keep that running as efficient as possible. And what we do with Empower is um, we really track the efficiency of this condenser online continuously and show the customer how efficient he is working at that moment. So for the ones who don't know, who are not power specialists, the condenser comes after the turbine. Right. Condenser is a heat exchanger. There is steam on one side and there is cooling water on the other side. The steam is transformed into water, condensate as we call it. And therefore the volume drops 17,000 times going from steam to water, creating a vacuum which pulls the steam through the turbine who is connected with the generator, who makes the electricity. Yeah. The cleaner we can keep the surface of the condenser and on the cooling side with our specialty chemicals, the greater, the bigger the vacuum is we create and the more power we can generate out of the turbine. So it's really critical to have a maximum vacuum and that is allowed by a clean surface, which we control with our specialty chemicals. So this, this has been used in a number of applications already, you know, not only in Europe, but around the world. What, what has been the response so far from the, uh, from the customers and from the, you know, the critical operators that are using it? Well, we kicked off this initiative in Europe in the UK. Um, and we have a lot of customers who are already onboarded, as we call it, uh, who run Empower uh, within Insight. Um, 
it's 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 very important for them um, because the power industry is suffering like all the other industries and they have to they have a low profit profitability at this moment so they have to keep the maximum they have to yeah re really keep the maximum megawatts out of their installation yeah um, so it's really critical that we help our customers by monitoring the efficiency of this condenser um, what we do in fact is we have spoken to these customers and they told us what they would like to see from us as a supplier. And they said, okay, if you can give me a dashboard, a simple dashboard where, can I, where I can see every day and every minute of the day how my condenser is performing, yeah? And you, you give me, in fact, a dashboard that was two, twofold. First dashboard with thermodynamic parameters where, can I, where I can make the diagnostics. But most important, the second dashboard, which gives me the economics. So if I don't run at the design efficiency or as near as possible, I have an economical penalty. penalty. And I want to see that economical penalty. And Empower is really a calcul calculation model who calculates the economical penalty when a condenser is non, non, not running optimal. Because it's, at that moment, you're losing productivity. You cannot produce the megawatts you want to produce. So you lose money, you lose profit. Secondly, if your system allows you to compensate that by burning more fuel, that's an extra cost. That's also an economical penalty. And if you have to burn more fuel, can be gas, can be coal, can be, any, uh, uh, can be biomass, renewables, you generate CO2. So okay. it's also the CO2 footprint of your plant. And that's, of course, at this moment, uh, when some sustainability becomes more import important, is one of the high priorities of every power plant. So in my 28 years of career, Ralph, this is the first time but that we have a, a direct link between the performance and the results of our chemical cooling water treatment program and the profit which our customers make. That's and unique. I think that's terrific because, and, and to, your, to your last point there, it's also a benefit for the environment, right? Because of the, of the CO2 footprint. So, you know, there's, uh, it's like a win-win-win scenario here. This is, this is really fantastic. In fact, what our customers told us is, we don't want you to be a supplier. We want you to be a, our partner. And right. based on the diagnostics we make with Empower and the dashboard, we can make decisions together with our customer to go back to the design efficiency, the applicable efficiency of his condenser, and to make the most profit for him. That's terrific. And, and that's definitely right in line with, with the way we try to operate with our customers everywhere. So this is, this is really uh, enabling us uh, to do exactly what, we're, uh, what we set out to do. So thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, that's terrific. I'm going to come back and ask you a few more questions here in a little bit, though. So don't go away. Okay. All right, let me, let's jump across the ocean here. I'm going to jump from the power industry to the ethanol industry. Uh, Dan, why don't you just give us a little bit of a highlight here? What are some of the main challenges that are going on right now in the ethanol industry? What are they facing into? Oh, uh, great question, Ralph. There are a couple big ones really in the ethanol industry, starting with uh, the fact that it's they run a very tight margin right now. For the last few few the, uh, renewable fuel margins have been very very thin, and then you couple that with the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, markets that they have to sell into, they're, they're just some big challenges that the industry has to add into all the other operational needs that they have. And so innovation is really what's driving the, the industry to try to meet these challenges. If you think about the, the, you know, the whole idea of the margin side of it, they're trying to develop co-products that have a higher value. And in fact, one of the, one of the standard lines you'll hear in the ethanol industry is that they're working to make ethanol the co-product because everything that's left over from the kernel of corn, they're trying to extract as much value 
uh, to sell as a co-product out in the marketplace from, from the high protein animal feeds, fish foods, uh, uh, a whole number of, of different products in, in addition to the low margin ethanol. And then just as in any industry, the economies of scale are driving these plants to try to, to make as much ethanol as possible, which is putting a lot of stress on plant operations. And then you take the LCFS, that low carbon fuel standard. Uh, you know, we were talking about, Joel was talking about the whole environmental aspect of this. There's actually a, a premium that an ethanol producer can earn to try to benefit that margin issue by reducing the amount of energy per gallon of ethanol produced so they can sell into L LCFS markets, which right now are mostly the West Coast of the US. Most of Canada is covered by this, but it's, it's moving across the US and you'll see it probably as a standard in North America and not in the not too distant future. So you think about managing all of these aspects, there's gonna be a certain amount of tension that comes with this. If you, if you think about trying to develop um, uh, a new process in order to improve a co-product recovery, uh, it may take more equipment, which is gonna require additional energy inputs, which are gonna threaten that low carbon fuel uh, effort. So they have to understand how to work with these interactions to, to develop uh, as much efficiency and optimize across a number of different vectors, if you will, to, to get a peak performance on profitability coming out of the plant. And that is, is how that producer is thinking every single day right now. Uh, which, is, which is a lot to think about, right? I mean, that's a, that's a very dynamic you know, situation and market uh, uh, that's going on right now. Now, we talked to Joel about, you know, a, a, you know, a, a calculation engine and an, an advanced analytic that's helping the power industry. I mentioned IVAP earlier. You know, we've got another very unique analytic uh, specific for this industry. Can you tell us about IVAP and, and uh, how does it help uh, this particular industry achieve some of their objectives? Right, right. So IVAP is, is uh, it's, it's supporting our customers' needs, uh, especially around the, the stillage evaporator system, which it's a large, in most of these sites, it's a large complex evaporation system that's designed to be extremely energy efficient, but doesn't have a whole lot of control capability because of the, just the style mm -hmm. of equipment that's, that's built into this system. It also uses as much as 40% of the steam energy in the plant. So it, it's kind of a, um, a, a blind spot, if you will, on their, on their ability to manage their uh, energy demands uh, in a very important piece of equipment that much like what, what Joel was talking about, it's a heat transfer piece of equipment. And so keeping it clean is vital to minimizing the amount of energy required to, uh, to, you know, to evaporate the water off these, these solids, which is where a lot of the co-products come from. Sure. Um, so with this much energy input, what, what we've been looking at doing is trying to help them uh, see into the evaporator system using IVAP. We've actually developed some correlations with uh, uh, um, other easily sensor monitoring on the eight vessel double effect array of evaporators that allows them to actually see what the actual evaporation rate is in each one of these vessels, which they've never been able to do before. And so what that really helps them do is to figure out which vessels are struggling that may require some uh, uh, cleaning activity. Uh, it may also help them identify what solids level they're able to get through that helps them with corn oil recovery processes. It essentially gives them insights into a more detailed performance monitoring of the evaporator system. Uh, right. system and, and it allows them a uh, much higher level of predictive capability to pinpoint when and where to address the cleaning actions. And, and these, uh, these cleaning actions are, are, might be just online CIPs or maybe once or twice a year, they actually bring the entire plant down to do a full hydroblasting of, of these vessels. And this is, this is a pretty substantial uh, piece of equipment with eight evaporator vessels that are, that are uh, involved. So the insights that the IVAP is providing and, it, and we do it through a, through a graphic user interface that allows the operations to understand exactly 
where things stand on the evaporators all the, across all eight vessels. They know which vessels are, are performing at what level. They can even predict when the next one will require cleaning. And IVAP has provided um, uh, producers as much as 60% reduction in how much time they spend on cleaning actions. Um, it's reduced the energy because they're cleaning the right vessels instead of just following a predict, uh, you know, a, an established pathway of we do this one this week, we do this one next week. This has allowed them to run cleaner, lower efficiency, and in, has, or higher efficiency, lower energy per gallon to the tune of over 5%. And what that means from, the, from that um, carbon intensity in that low carbon fuel standard segment, that's over a million dollars of additional premium that they can get for their fuel as a result of running the evaporator more efficiently. So it's, if you think about it, it's easier to run. They, they know where they stand. They know what they need to do. Uh, they save on, on natural gas. They save on cleaning chemicals. They save on time. And they get more benefit on their, on their uh, carbon intensity and LCFS standards as well. It's, it's again, the win-win-win all the way around. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So they, I mean, look, this is very interesting and it's for a very specific, you know, space and application, you know, with your experience with all this, do you envision, you know, sort of further use of these types of tools and concepts, uh, you know, of IVAP, you know, both inside and outside the renewable energy space? Uh, yeah, well, let's, let's talk about inside. Uh, we're, we're moving from, um, I will say relatively primitive uh, algorithms right now more toward machine learning, even with the IVAP system we have now to bring in multiple variables, variables, excuse me, that, that we know have an influence, but we've never been able to really understand mm -hmm. what kind of influence. Machine learning will help take care of that. So internal, okay. nothing but improvement there. Um, we also look within, just within the ethanol industry alone, just using the same concepts of, of, of understanding a process, modeling it, and developing analytics behind it to improve it, to, to support some of those new co-product streams that they're working on developing as well. Because there will be a lot of opportunity for efficiency improvement of those as they bring them on stream. And if you think about it, uh, it you look at Empower as well that Joel talked about, that is using the same concepts. And, and I would say right. in any industry, if you, if you start by understanding um, you know, what the, what system parameters are, model the system, understand what the control uh, aspects are. If you can model the process, you can develop the capability to optimize it using analytics like this. And, and I think with the IoT, with, with uh, you know, machine learning, with sensors that are becoming uh, far more, you know, they're, they're wireless, they're smaller, they're cheaper. Right. There's so much more that you can measure to bring in and, and develop those algorithms that are going to change the game for, for processes. If you, if you can imagine how it can work, you can develop the analytics package to, to work. And it's just, it just has to bet. be important to the customer and important to, uh, you know, to the system to do it. Yeah, you bet. I, I couldn't agree more. I think we're, you know, we've got a terrific foundation to build off of and, and there's, you know, we're kind of early stage here. And all the different you know applications that uh, that we can tackle when you combine sort of just you know our inherent you know knowledge and, and experience and expertise in all these applications with the foundation of the of the insight tool and now adding in these powerful calculation engines using machine learning and and artificial intelligence it's uh, it, it's really going to you know change the way that we uh, that we operate going forward so it's it's great the work that you guys are doing here. Um, let me switch a little bit, and I'm going to come back to you as, again, Dan, as well. But uh, Andrew, I, I want to jump right into you know the you know the the big issue that we're all facing into uh, around the world, and that's relative to COVID-19. So, um, you know, with everything that's going on here, what what are you seeing, and what has been really the biggest trends for remote monitoring and diagnostics? You know, in light of you know what we're facing into with COVID-19. Sure. Okay. Great question, Ralph. Um, COVID-19 really has um, changed how we look at uh, assisting our customers in maintaining the health of their assets. Um, the travel restrictions, the limitations of, of accessing customer sites uh, have really put an emphasis on what we can do remotely. 
Um, so we've been on this, this remote monitoring and diagnostic journey for, for decades now. Uh, the Insight platform has, has been, um, been improved over the past 10 years, and we now have uh, over 5,000 customers that participate in this platform. Um, in, in the COVID era, uh, being able to look at real-time data that's being entered into our cloud-based platform, uh, trend how the asset's performing, receive alarms, be able to, to engage our customers who are still on, at their sites uh, while we may be working remotely, uh, really enables us to deliver the support that they need during these challenging times. So, um, you know, that's been a critical aspect. Th things as simple as um, inventory management has been a, a real topic for us. Uh, measuring the levels of chemistry that we've got at a customer site using uh, deployed tank sensors. This has been something that we've been doing for years, but again, the, the changes that COVID has caused in terms of access and, and travel have really put an emphasis on scaling these capabilities quickly. Um, so our team is, is really engaged on, on bringing those technologies across all of our customers now uh, in, in enabling them to have this, this safety uh, that we can provide uh, through our expert service remotely. Yeah, could, I couldn't agree more. And it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's gone from, you know, uh, an interest and, you know, a, a kind of a push to more of a pull, I think, uh, with, with what COVID has done you know, relative to all these capabilities that we have here. But, you know, look, visibility is critical for, for RM&D, but beyond the visibility that remote monitoring and diagnostic provides, what, what support are our customers requesting uh, and, and how are we responding to that? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, you know, visibility is great, but um, a lot of what we're seeing now is I mean, our expertise is how to control our platforms in the field, whether it's a, an analyzer or a, a dosage control system. Um, we're seeing customers engaging us in a discussion of how can you operate those systems remotely in a safe and secure fashion to, again, provide us with the level of service we need while protecting both the customer and ourselves. Um, security yeah. is obviously a, a key topic when we start talking about uh, this, where we're we're engaging with a remote asset. So we're making sure that we're looking at the, you know, the industry leading standards in terms of how we're building platforms. Uh, we recently uh, released a new product into this market. It's called Insight Edge. So this is a, a true uh, IIoT control platform uh, that's designed from its core to be remotely manageable. So it has the best in security in the industry. Uh, it has uh, configuration control and adjustment built in from its very starting point. So we're starting to see uh, the penetration of that product into the market. Uh, and it's really gonna allow us to support a customer at a different level. We'll be able to uh, help them in terms of controlling an existing asset, changing configurations. And, and one topic that's come up uh, relatively recently is how, we, how can we help support new applications? How can we deploy assets um, well, uh, still being positioned remotely. So this, this platform will allow us to, to serve our customers in that aspect as well. You bet. And, you know, look, it's, you know, everything that we're talking about here, asset performance management software, advanced analytics, you know, sensors, controllers, and now we're talking, you know, edge devices. You know, it's such a great compliment when you look at, at sort of that ecosystem of, of IoT. Uh, it's, it's really phenomenal how all this is coming together. But but what do you see, like, what is the technology that, that you see that's, that's playing even a bigger role in the water services industry in, in the coming years? Yeah, so uh, we've been exploring different technologies and we've seen them uh, on the market as well. One that really is sticking out on how we can uh, expand our capabilities to serve customers is around augmented reality. So you know, that's the concept where I'm using a mobile device where I can see I can see the asset, I can overlay images on top of it. I can deliver a level of service into the field from a remote expert that just isn't possible today. So we've looked at and, and worked with several different platforms. There, there are a number in the industry now uh, that can deliver this capability. We've used them to be able to provide uh, field service, uh, so repair of equipment. Right. Uh, we've looked at opportunities to deploy new equipment using this and just provide that extra level of expertise 
that either our customer or our field team doesn't have. I think that's going to be a trend that we're going to see even when the travel restrictions uh, are lifted. Um, having experts that can deliver uh, you know, critical information to the point of use uh, without getting on an airplane and traveling, I think is going to be a trend that we're just going to see expand uh, as we move forward year over year. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, look, the days of old is, you know, we wouldn't think twice about, you know, sending somebody out in the field to uh, to do some of those things that you, that you mentioned. And now, you know, we're able to tap into many of our experts that live in all parts of the world to solve problems in, just virtually anywhere now. I mean, it's really, really amazing uh, the direction that we're going here. So listen, team, I, you know, I, I, I warned Dan and, and Joel, I'd circle back with them, but um, Dan, I'm going to pick on you first. So Andrew touched on, on really the impact that COVID-19 pandemic is, is having on, on our customers and specific on our customer needs. But, you know, for you, how, how, what are you seeing here? How has COVID-19, you know, shifted your plans in the development and commercialization of, of the solutions like IVAP? Well, it's it's been it's been a challenge, of course. What's what's interesting is we actually started up our first IVAP system just before the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. and there was a question about the robustness of of our sensors and our technology, and we were not allowed into that customer site for three and a half months uh, once the pandemic had hit. So we were still monitoring remotely. We had that capability because we set the system up. Uh, to be able to do so. So we, we were able to see what was going on. We were able to work with the customer to troubleshoot, but we didn't know if our sensors were, were holding, holding calibrations, for example. Uh, fortunately, they did, but having that, having that capability to be able to see what's going on, not just with a new system, but even with, uh, even with existing systems through some of our monitoring and control that we have out there for all of our chemical feed systems, for example, is, is just been, um, I don't want to call it a, a game changer, but it certainly made it easier to sleep at night, knowing that, that things were running where they needed to be right. running. We couldn't go out to, to get hands on the system. One other thing I think is interesting, uh, just to not, it's not IVAP related or even our chemical treatment program related, but uh, most of our customers out here in the Midwest are ethanol producers, and, and the pandemic actually developed a whole new market for uh, uh, many ethanol producers right now. The hand sanitizer market has exploded. Sure. Most of that is, has been born in, the, in the, uh, the dry milling corn ethanol market yeah. in the U.S. right now, and, and uh, we're actually producing a, a product right now as well, a hand sanitizer that Sue has enabled uh, along with one of our one of our customers out here uh, is our partner. So, you know, anything anything like a pandemic brings challenges, but it also brings opportunities. And it's just making right. sure to, to be ready for it. The things that Andy's doing, for example, uh, uh, makes that possible. I'm, I'm glad it happened, you know, if it's gonna happen, I'm glad it happened in a time when we're prepared to be able to start you know, implementing things like this. Couldn't agree more. And Joelle, how about you? Like. Uh... You know, I know the pandemic's been a challenge all over, but, you know, how did it impact sort of the rollout of Empower and, and what you guys are working on? Well, uh, the good thing on, on COVID is that uh, a lot of people are at home, uh, have time to think. So we were able to be in intimate contact with a lot of our customers, our customers, to validate our dashboards. So we are now there and it wouldn't have been the case, I think, if COVID was not there. And it's maybe strange that I say that, but we were able now to have the right dashboard in place, which our customers want to see. I give just one example. Um, we have a, a customer in the UK. Uh, we onboarded him and he has now uh, Empower on his PC. So every day, he is at home, he can see how his condenser is performing. And yeah, he was a little bit worried because he said, yeah, hey guys, I see a, 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 a negative trend. So I'm losing efficiency. Mm. Of course, we have seen that also, uh, we were in co intimate contact with him. It showed that he suffered a lot of biofouling, specific fouling, 
uh, created by a biofilm on the cooling side of this condenser. We calculated that he lost or that he would lose with only 2% less efficiency with the current power price in the UK, he would lose $1.5 million. Yeah. And even if you, if you would see the trend, you, you even, yeah, you, you need a long period before you see it. Yeah. So what, what we did is we, we did a test now, we implemented uh, uh, biodispersion, which is a specific dispersion to prevent this biofilm on the cooling side of its condenser. And we wrote this efficiency up to near design efficiency. So up 2%. I think this is so crucial, the direct link between our chemical and the profit he makes, that's just something which, in, again, in my 28 years of career, I've never seen before. I could not demonstrate the payback of a bio dispersant, which is costing 200K dollars per year for him, giving right. 1.5 million dollars of savings. So I could wow. calculate on the penny how much was the payback, the return on investment. That, I mean, that's real impact, that's real return on investment. And, you know, it really, you know, it really comes down to how all these, how all these tools and services are coming together. And, uh, you know, congratulations uh, to you and, and to all you guys for all the work you're doing here to put this together. I want to thank, you know, everybody uh, on the panel here, you know, Joel, Dan, Andrew, you know, can't thank you guys enough for, for this discussion. Uh, really terrific thoughts, uh, really great real-time examples of what's going on, uh, and very, very thought-provoking as well. I appreciate it. And so now uh, I want to leave uh, everyone here with just a short video, which highlights our Empower Advanced Analytic that we, we've been talking about a little bit here. Uh, and it was just really just unveiled earlier this week, so it's, it's kind of hot off the presses. So uh, thank you again, everybody, and, uh, and please enjoy. For Suez, IoT is at the heart of the services we provide to our customers. Uh, this is an area that we believe in and that we have invested in to grow our capabilities to offer one of the most comprehensive end-to-end -end IoT solutions in the water industry. As more and more customers begin to adopt and embrace IoT solutions, 
it's going to bring more and more benefits to the water industry as a whole. You know, together we can change the world. I want to thank you again for joining. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this part of Suez Innovation Demo Day. This was just one of nine webinars organized by Suez across the globe. If you want to learn more about the topics like the circular economy, open innovation, zero waste, zero carbon, health and environment interactions, climate change, and emerging risks, you can watch replays of all the other webinars right here on the platform. Have a great rest of your day. Thank <laughs> you.